good. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's Dr. Zena Hanoush. Dr. Hanoush is an assistant professor of clinical medicine in the Department of Diabetes and Metabolism. She went to medical school at the Universidad Central de Venezuela, and she completed internal medicine residency and endocrinology fellowship at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital program. She's published multiple case reports, review articles covering different topics on thyroid metabolism and neuroendocrine disorders, as well as a few reports of novel mutations found to cause endocrine-related diseases. Her clinical interests include thyroid metabolism and neuroendocrine tumors, or neuro neuroendocrine disorders, I'm sorry. Today, she will be presenting a family with hypothyroidism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy um, for the opportunity to present today. Um, it seems like I'm coming up with a sore throat <laughs> that I cut from my kids, so apologize if my voice is not <clears throat> up to the standards today. And so my goal for the next 30 minutes is going to be to see if we can get our minds off of the stress and anticipation of the elections by sharing with you an interesting um, story about a family with hypothyroidism and how molecular testing can give us insight into common diseases. So here are my disclosures. Why don't we just get started with a case? This is a 30-year-old female who came to my clinic for the management of primary hypothyroidism after thyroidectomy. She had had thyroidectomy in February of this year because she had a very big multinodular goiter that was causing some local neck compression symptoms. And the pathology after the surgery was benign. So this is very straightforward. She's coming into clinic so that the endocrinologist, me, can titrate the levothyroxine medication she's taking to her appropriate TSH. This is the patient that when you're screening through your schedule, you say, easy peasy, bread and butter, I'll be able to get uh, finished with this case in 15 minutes. <clears throat> Getting a little bit more history, um, we learned that she was diagnosed with hypothyroidism at birth when she had screening of her thyroid function test. She in, ended up in the ICU postnatally after she was born from a natural vaginal delivery. And she also has developmental delay. She was not able to graduate from high school. She um, lives with her, with her mother, who is her proxy, and she clearly has some <clears throat> deficiencies in the IQ. So what is the differential diagnosis of someone who's presenting with primary hypothyroidism? This is something that all of you are going to be very familiar with. Um, an internal medicine physician has seen people with primary hypothyroidism because they had their thyroid, re thyroid removed, just like, like this patient, maybe after ablation. Autoimmune is the most common cause of primary hypothyroidism in the United States, Hashimoto's. But this patient was diagnosed at birth. So we got it including the differential, congenital hypothyroidism. <clears throat> congenital hypothyroidism is like a whole other world in itself. And it can be caused by problems or deficiencies in different parts of normal thyroid physiology. There can be issues in the thyroid gland development called dysgenesis. There could be problems in thyroid hormone synthesis and secretion called, um, known as dyshormogenesis. Or there can be defects in thyroid hormone metabolism and action. And there's been mutations um, in a whole um, long list of different genes that have been discovered that we know play a part in the normal physiology of thyroid hormone. And then when they are mutated, they can cause any of these types of congenital hypothyroidism. But a lot of the cases are still undiagnosed or a lot of the genes have not been properly um, been discovered or described. <clears throat> there's still a lot to be learned. So this patient had her thyroid removed. Now we need to give her thyroid hormone. Very straightforward. Um, what type of thyroid hormone are we going to give her? Well, we could use just T4 alone, also known the generic levothyroxine, the synthetic form of T4. And there's different brands. You can pick whatever you, you prefer, Synthroid, Unitroid, Tyrosine. This is like Pepsi or Coca-Cola. You can pick your preferred brand choice. Or you can decide to give combined therapy of T4 plus T3. And there's different options also. Some of them are extracts from um, thyroids of animals, like um, armor thyroid or nature thyroid. Um, they can come from pigs. And so which one should we choose? And those of you familiar with American College of Physicians um, 
guidelines, American Thyroid Association guidelines, pretty much all the formal medical guidelines. USMLE loves to test us on these topics. You know that the standard of care is T4 alone. T4 plus T3 is really not standard of care. And I'm gonna review quickly with you why. Why is it that we recommend to give only T4 for thyroid hormone supplementation in patients with, with hypothyroidism and not T3 or T3 plus T4? Well, the first thing we need to remember <clears throat> is that a normal thyroid gland makes mostly only T4. 80 or 90% of what our thyroid gland makes is T4, which if you think of it, is like a pro-hormone. And T4 is gonna travel in the blood and be converted to the most active form, T3, on demand. And so <clears throat> few reasons why not to give T3 include, T3 has a shorter half-life, so you would need to take the medication multiple times a day as opposed to T4, which has a half-life of about seven days, which is a very long half-life. T3 is not transported across the blood-brain barrier. Each tissue can convert T4 to the exact amount of T3 that it needs. So if you're giving a fixed amount of T3 in a pill form, maybe you're putting your heart, subjecting your heart to higher levels of T3 than it needs, but maybe your brain is getting less amount. And there's always at least the theoretical um, risk of, putting, of, of causing iatrogenic hyperthyroidism by over-supplementation of T3. There is really no good evidence that T3 alleviates the symptoms of hypothyroidism, although any thyroid specialist who's seen thyroid cases all, all day knows that there's a small amount of highly vocal patients who might disagree with this statement. And lastly, there are variable amounts of T3 in, in animal um, extracts. Pig's thyroids are not the same as human thyroids. And like I said, human thyroids makes maybe 80 or 90% of T4 and just a small portion of T3. Animal thyroids make higher proportions of T3. So the ratio of T4 to T3 in those thyroid extracts is off and we're putting the patients, um, su subjecting patients at higher levels of T3 of, from what they really need. <clears throat> so we're gonna give her T4 alone, great. How much, how do we calculate? Well, some of you might be familiar with the 1.6 micrograms per kilo estimate as a starting dose. Well, that might change based on the BMI of the patient, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending, and also based on the age of the patient. And, and, and here we have this formula that can help you estimate how much thyroid hormone you're gonna start the patient with. But once you start the patient in a certain dose, you're not just gonna keep the patient in that dose and not reassess. You're gonna be monitoring the patient and monitoring their thyroid function tests and adjusting the dose accordingly. And I wanna make a caveat that this um, estimate of 1.6 micrograms per kilo is usually for thyroidectomized patients. If you put your patient with Hashimoto's who still has a thyroid in place and has some thyroid function reserve on this dose, you might overtreat them and cause some iatrogenic hyperthyroidism. So the bottom line is that you're always gonna use your clinical judgment and that you're gonna be monitoring your levels to see whether the dose needs to go up or down. How are you gonna be monitoring these levels? You're gonna be targeting your therapy to TSH. And remember that T4 has a long half-life of about a week. So you wanna wait about four and a half half-lives to reach steady state. And that's why you should remeasure your TSH about a month after you make any adjustments to levothyroxine. But why do we adjust it to TSH? Why don't we adjust it to T3, T4, for example? Well, here's the answer. There's a negative logarithmic relationship between TSH and free T4. Free T4 levels drop a tiny bit, TSH increases a lot. Free T4 levels increase a tiny bit, TSH drops a lot. This is true for primary hypo and hyperthyroidism. When the communication between the thyroid and the pituitary is preserved and the negative feedback loop is not affected. And so because the range of changes in TSH is a lot wider, TSH is a lot more sensitive and you're gonna be able to pick up changes in TSH earlier. This is why in the most subtle cases of subclinical hypo and subclinical hyperthyroidism, the first lab that is gonna be picked up out of the normal range is gonna be your TSH. <clears throat> All right, so, so far so good, very straightforward. She had her thyroid removed. We're gonna give her thyroid hormone. We're gonna give her only T4, not T3 we're gonna adjust the therapy to TSH. Is that it? Well, maybe there is more. So we started getting a family history. 
And when you start getting a family history in this case, I learned that three out of four siblings from the same unaffected parents had a similar presentation. Her <clears throat> younger sister and brother also have congenital hypothyroidism. They were all diagnosed close to the time where they were born. They all have very large goiters. They all have developmental delay. However, the younger brother has a little bit, is a little bit less affected. He was able to graduate from college. He lives independently. Um, he's working part-time at Burger King. <clears throat> but he still has um, some um, <clears throat> changes in his IQ, but not as severe as the two sisters. So let's put here the history together by looking at the family pedigree. So here we have males in squares, females in circles. Anyone who has a purple mark here um, is affected, meaning that they have hypothyroidism, they are on levothyroxine hormone replacement, and they have a large goiter, and they have developmental delay. And so when I see this family, I go and I reach to our very own Dr. Wise, who loves to get to the bottom of the molecular basis of cases just like this one. And I ask him, should we get blood, of the, blood samples of this uh, family to do some genetic testing? And he said, for sure. So the hunt began. And it's not easy, I'll tell you. You really need to get the blood work of all the family members to be able to make sense of the results of the genetic analysis. And some of these family members are not in Miami. They have not talked to their relatives for 20 plus years. They might be in rural areas of Central America. We're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemia and there are travel restrictions. So we're lucky because we have a very diverse set of fellows and trainees in UM. So I reached out to one of our fellows who is one from the, one of the countries where one of these patients was located. He started calling colleagues and we were able to successfully <clears throat> collect blood sample of all of the family members. And so we did whole exome sequencing of the two affected sisters, these two individuals. And so what is whole exome sequencing? Well, it's a widely used next generation sequencing method that involves sequencing protein coding regions of the genome. So we're coding only for the, we're sequencing only the coding regions. And even though that's less than 2% of the genome, it contains about 85% of all known diseases related variant. So this is very cost effective, um, a lot less costly than the whole genome sequencing. And, um, and, and so it's a very effective method um, for a broad range of applications, including population genetics, genetic diseases, cancer studies, and so on. And so we start paying closer attention to genes that we know are high yield based on the presentation. This is a list of genes that we know have been described to be associated with congenital hypothyroidism when mutated. And so when we look at the analysis of the whole um, exome sequencing, we see that there's a bunch of mutations in some of these genes, but only two of them are highlighted in yellow, the diiodinase type 1 gene and the thyroid peroxidase gene down here. Why? Because we did find one missense mutation in the diiodinase type 1 gene that had the potential of being deleterious, of causing phenotype-relevant um, changes. And here in the thyroid peroxidase gene, there were a few mutations, five missense. I'll tell you that two out of these five missense mutation also, um, based on the analysis, <clears throat> yielded a predictability of having a deleterious effect. So we want to take a closer look at these two genes in these three mutations. So let's start with the first one. This is the thyroid peroxidase gene, chromosome 2, exon 8. This is an exonic mut mutation, a missense single nucleotide variant. We're substituting a C for an A. And when we see here um, the in silica analysis report, we see that both of the affected sisters are heterogeneous for this mutation, a substitution of a C. For, for an A. This is a novel mutation, it hasn't been described before, so we don't really have any clinical data of how common or rare this mutation might be, but we do know from the in silicon analysis report that this mutation 
is predicted to be deleterious and be associated with the phenotype that we're seeing. So we want to see what's happening in this, regarding this particular mutation in the rest of the family members in our pedigree. So we Sanger sequence, sequencing. Again, we're talking about the thyroperoxidase gene, chromosome two, this is the position, exon eight, group substituting a C for an A. It's a missense single nucleotide variant mutation. And what do we find? When, when you do Sanger sequencing, you get a chromatograph just like the one that you have down here. And basically what we wanna see is who is heterozygous for this mutation, the substitution for a C and an A. And if you are heterozygous, you're gonna see two humps of two different colors down here. A green hump for an A and a blue hump for a C. So let's see, who has two humps? This individual right here has two humps, so she's heterozygous for the mutation. This one also has two humps, this one as well, and the mother over here as well. So this means that this mutation, the thyroperoxidase mutation of exon eight came from the mother and the three affected children inherited. The father and the unaffected daughter, on the other hand, they are wild type for this particular mutation. <clears throat> and then let's look at the other mutation that we found on the thyroid peroxidase gene. This one is located in exon 12. Again, is a min sense single nucleotide variant. We're substituting a C for a T. And when we look at the um, in silica analysis, we see that again, the two affected sisters are heterozygous for this mutation. Again, novel mutation. We don't have any um, information about how frequent it is, but it is predicted to be deleterious. And when we look at the Sanger sequencing analysis for this other mutation, the exon 12 mutation of the thyroperoxidase gene, we see that those who have two humps are the affected daughter, the other affected daughter, the affected son, and this time, the mutation came from the father. He has two humps. He is heterocycle. There's a blue hump and a red hump. The unaffected sister and the mother, they are wild type. They don't carry this mutation. So let's put this stuff together. What do we have? In red, we have labeled individuals who have the mutation in the thyroperoxidase gene exon 12. In green, we have labeled those who have the thyroperoxidase uh, mutation in exon 8. Father had the exon 12 mutation and the three affected children inherited it. Mother had the exon 8 mutation and the three affected children inherited. Father doesn't have hypothyroidism or developmental delay or any problems. And mom doesn't have any of that either. So this means this is a combined heterozygous mutation. If you just get one of them, you're fine. But if you inherited both of them, then you get the phenotype. All right, that's all great but that wasn't the end of it, right? Plus, I need to explain to you what thyroid peroxidase is. Why getting a mutation in this gene would give you problems with thyroid function anyway? So we need to review a little bit of physiology here. Here we have a histology slide in which we're looking at thyroid follicles. These are all our follicular thyroid cells beautifully organized in the thyroid follicles. They are the ones who are synthesizing and making thyroid hormone and storing it right here inside this bubble, which is the colloid. It's a fluid solution where you store thyroid hormone. You have over a month's worth of thyroid hormone nicely packed and stored in there until TSH comes in, knocks on the door and tells the follicular cells, hey, we need some of that thyroid hormone to come out into the bloodstream and then it can be released in there. So how does the synthesis process happen? Well, here we have a blowout of um, a zoom into one of the follicular thyroid cells. This is the vasolateral cell membrane. This is the apical cell membrane. This is where the colloid is. Here in the basolateral cell membrane, we have the sodium iodine symporter, which is gonna allow the follicular thyroid cells to concentrate iodine inside the cell against its gradient. And then the process of thyroid hormone synthesis is gonna start. You need to oxidize the iodine. You need to <clears throat> incorporate iodine into these thyroid residues that you have over here and go through a process of um, organification and coupling. And who catalyzes all of this, all of these processes of oxidation, organification, and coupling? Well, here it is, 
thyroid peroxidase. This is the main en enzyme that catalyzes the synthesis of thyroid hormone. So no wonder if you have a mutation in thyroid peroxidase, then you're not gonna be able to synthesize thyroid hormone. You might remember thyroid peroxidase because we commonly check thyroid peroxidase antibodies to screen for Hashimoto's. Patients with Hashimoto's have antibodies against thyroid peroxidase. You might also remember thyroid peroxidase because when you give met or PTU to patients who have hyperthyroidism, you're giving them a medication that inhibits thyroid peroxidase to try to treat their hyperthyroidism. So it's clearly a very relevant enzyme in the synthesis of thyroid hormone. <clears throat> And so the story didn't end there because I told you that we also found a mutation in a different gene, the diiodinase type 1 gene. We found a mutation that was also a missense single nucleotide mutation substituting a G for an A that, had, that was also predicted to be deleterious. And so we look into the in silica analysis again, and we see that again, the two affected sisters, they are heterozygous for this mutation. And this one is not a noble mutation. It's been described before, but it's clearly very rare. If we focus here in the Latino population, look at the frequency of this mutation. It's very, very rare. Let's look at the Sanger sequencing for the diiodinase mutation. What do we find here? Well, who has two humps? Father has two humps. The two affected sister has two humps. But surprisingly, the younger boy, who also has congenital hypothyroidism, he doesn't have this mutation. He is wild type. And the unaffected healthy sister, she did inherit this mutation. So something might not make 100% sense here. And it's looking a little bit different from the pattern that you would have predicted. Let's see first what diiodinase is. Why having a mutation in the, di in the diiodinase type 1 gene would confer any issues or problems with your thyroid hormones? Well, remember that most of what thyroid, the thyroid gland makes is T4. It's like a pro-hormone. And basically the structure of T4 is two tyrosine residues with four iodines attached to it. T4 goes and travels in the blood and is gonna get converted to the most active form T3. How does that happen? Well, if you remove this outer ring iodine over here, you can convert T4 into the most active form T3. Who takes care of this? Who are the enzymes that catalyze this conversion? The diiodinase type 1 and type 2 enzymes. On the other hand, you can decide to take this inner ring iodine over here and actually convert T4 to reverse T3, which is a not a form of, of thyroid hormone. And this is something catalyzed by the diiodinase type 3. So here, we have this nice table showing us how diiodinase type 1 is an enzyme that is very important in the, con in the peripheral conversion of T4 to its most active form of hormone T3 in the peripheral tissue. And if you have a deficiency in the diiodinase type 1, then you can have some signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism because of deficiency in T3 levels. So let's put everything that we found in this family together. We have in green, the exon 12 mutation, in red, the exon 8 mutation, in blue, the diiodinase type 1 mutation. Each of the um, T thyroid peroxidase mutations was um, inherited from one from the father, the other one from the mother, and the three affected children inherited them. And we have already concluded that this is a combined heterozygous mutation. And the diiodinase mutation came from the father. The two affected sisters have it, but also the unaffected sister. Does it play a role in phenotype at all? Well, remember, like I said, that the younger boy, he had congenital hypothyroidism and a large goiter and some developmental delay, but that it was not as severe as his, his two other sisters. He was able to get through college. He's working at Burger King. He lives independently. Well, maybe the diiodinase is modulating the expression of the thyroperoxidase, or there's an ad additive effect of having more than one mutation or more than one gene affected, worsening the clinical presentation. So to explore this a little bit further and see if this theory makes any sense, we can look at the laboratory test results of these patients. Here, I share them with you. This is a busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. it <clears throat> Sorry, here we have the blood test results of the father, the unaffected sister, and so on. Everyone is spared in their location. 
And in red, we have highlighted levels that are above the limit of normal. In blue, levels are below the limit of normal. What do we see here? Well, to start, no one has any problems with the levels of antibodies, star peroxidase antibodies or, or thyroglobulin antibodies, and no one has any problems with thyroglobulin levels, with, sorry, with thyroid binding globulin level over here. So there's no autoimmune issues here or TBG issues here. Um, <clears throat> however, we do see that some of the individuals have high levels of total T4 or high levels of reverse T3. How do we make sense of these blood tests? And do they correlate with our findings in our genetic analysis? Well, this looks too confusing. So we might want to look at it a little bit differently. We can calculate ratios. Here I'm giving you the blood test result of all of these individuals when we calculate the reverse T3 over total T3 levels and the total T4 over total T3 levels. And like I said, the iodinase type 1 is an enzyme that plays an important role in activating T4 into T3. So if you have a deficiency in this enzyme, you would expect these ratios to be elevated. And when we look at these ratios, we see that this actually is true. Those who have inherited the diiodinase mutation have higher ratios. But more significantly, the two sisters who have all three mutations, the two mutations in the thyroperoxidase gene, as well as the mutation in the diiodinase gene, they are the ones who have the highest of all of these ratios correlating with our theory that there is an, uh, an additive effect of having more than one mutation um, in the phenotype. To go along with these findings, we look at the results reported by this um, paper that recently came out from Japan in August of this year in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology. This is a study in which they conducted next generation sequencing of about 167 patients with congenital hypothyroidism. And they also looked at the high yield genes that we know correlate with congenital hypothyroidism to see if they found any mutations in these genes. And then- One, one minute, Zinnia. One minute. About to wrap up, thank you. And so what they found here is that those individuals that they um, classified as oligogenic, meaning that they found more than one mutation, more than one gene is mutated, really have higher levels of TSH, lower levels of T4. They needed higher levels of thyroid hormone replacement compared to the monogenic ones, concluding that oligogenic cases with congenital hypothyroidism may be more severe than monogenic cases suggesting a gene dosage effect. So in conclusion, complete family history is necessary for the proper diagnosis and management of common diseases that can present with uncommon presentations. Whole exon sequencing can be informative for the molecular diagnosis of diseases. The clinical response to treatment can be influenced by genetic analysis. And genetic analysis of congenital diseases has been a cornerstone in understanding the normal physiology. We know a lot about how normal thyroid function, um, normal, normal thyroid physiology works from the analysis and results of cases just like the one that I'm sharing with you guys today. I wanna just give a very special thanks to um, Dr. Wise, who's been my mentor and has guided me through every step of the way for this presentation, Eric Foreman, research is, um, assistant, who conducted pretty much all of the genetic analysis for this study, and, and Dr. Barrera, one of our very own endocrine fellows, who was very important in helping us uh, in the hunt of obtaining the blood tests of all of these family members. And I hope everyone has a very high, healthy and happy thyroid. This is from a medical student who drew this cartoon a few years ago. Thank you. Dr. Hanush, that was just superb. Thank you so much for making such a clear presentation uh, and showing us the utility of really, you can discover new things in the clinic just by paying attention to uh, the details and taking a family history. You presented it clearly and understandably, and I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for, for that. Thank you. You're, we're all proud of you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, Okay, well, if you do, you know how to reach Dr. Hanush, and she's more than happy to take care of any of your thyroid uh, patients. Um, 
Okay, we'll, we'll move on, Dr. Morrison. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our second speaker. <coughs> it's Dr. Gabriel Contreras. So Dr. Contreras is a professor of clinical medicine in the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at University of Miami, and also the Director of Clinical Research for the Katz Family Division of Nephrology and Hypertension. He went to medical school at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma in Mexico, and he completed his medical residency at the Harlem Hospital Center of Columbia University and his Nephrology and Critical Care Medicine Fellowships at University of Miami. During his time as faculty in the Department of Medicine, he's been involved in the development and establishment of a successful clinical research program in the Division of Nephrology with the accrual of 24 research grants and 97 publications in peer-reviewed journals in the area of nephrology, hypertension, with a special commitment to improving kidney outcomes in racial and ethnic minorities. Today, he will be presenting, do adults with systolic blood pressure between 130 and 139 and high cardiovascular risk need treatment? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, this slide just outlined um, the areas that I'm gonna review trying to answer that question. And at the end in the CME, you will have a case um, that you can um, answer. Um, now, let's start with the 2017 High Blood Pressure Clinical Guideline. This guideline made a big change in the way that hypertension is designed and categorized adults' blood pressure in four different groups. Number one, normal is when the pressure is less than 120 over 80. Two, elevated blood pressure. When the systolic blood pressure is between 120 to 129, diastolic less than 80. Hypertension is stage one, when the systolic is uh, between 130 and 139, or diastolic between 80 and 89. And hypertension is stage two, when systolic is 140 or higher, or diastolic 90 or higher. Now, there are several reasons why the new uh, guideline reclassified what used to be um, pre-hypertension in JNC7 as a stage one hypertension. Many observational data, and I'm going to present um, some in this slide, had uh, demonstrated a minimally elevated blood pressure compared to normal blood pressure values, gradually increased the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease and end stage renal disease, with the highest risk in the subgroup that um, had range of blood pressure of what we call now stage one hypertension. Uh, the um, relative risk is 1.8 for cardiovascular disease and for end-stage renal disease is twofold higher compared to the referent uh, group. The SPRING results, the SPRING is the systolic um, blood pressure interventional trial uh, completed uh, about um, now about uh, five years ago. Uh, the results determine the hypertension treatment goal of the new guideline aiming for um, controlling the blood pressure to less than 130 over 80 in patients with high cardiovascular risk. In the spring, uh, adults 50 years of age with cardiovascular risk and screening blood pressure between 130 to 180 were randomized to an intensive systolic um, goal of less than 120 or a standard systolic blood pressure goal less than 140. As you can see here, the, the primary outcome was met in the study, um, uh, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal significantly reduced the hazard uh, of the primary composite outcome compared to a standard systolic blood pressure goal. In this intensive systolic blood pressure goal, 243 events occur, an incident rate of 1.65% per year, and the standard blood pressure goal 319 events occur with an incidence of, uh, incidence of 2.19%. Uh, During a follow-up, median follow-up of 3.26 years, the number needed to treat estimate in the study was 61, which translates in a little over 275,000 preventable events with an estimated 16.8 million USA adults at risk that fulfilled the SPRING criteria. Now, what you see here in this um, bar graph is the crude prevalence of hypertension based on the JNC7 uh, threshold 
of 140 over 90, defining hypertension, and based on the 217 uh, threshold of 130 over 80. What you can see is that there is a significant increase in the prevalence from 31.9% to 45.6%, which translate that for every two adults in USA, uh, one of them uh, will uh, be at some point uh, hypertensive. The absolute uh, difference between the two definitions of hypertension is 13.7%, uh, which is equivalent to approximately 30.1 million of adults uh, in the USA with stage one hypertension. Now, in the summer of this year, our group published a study in the Journal of Hypertension titled Outcomes in Adults with Systolic Blood Pressure Between 130 and 139 in a Corby P in Spring. The hypothesis of the study was that if elevated systolic blood pressure between 130 and 139 is an unequivocal risk factor for CBD in adults, then targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure of less than 120 compared to uh, less than 140 will significantly reduce the risk of cardiovascular events in randomized controlled uh, trials. A core BP and spring are two of the largest uh, hypertension trial published in the past uh, 10 years. Now, why using a core BP and spring uh, to do this uh, study? Well, first, the prevalence of systolic blood pressure between 130 and 139 as screening was high, 40% in a core BP, 37% spring. Second, a core BP in spring provide a unique opportunity to examine the effect of intensive a systolic blood pressure goal in adults with stage one hypertension with a wide age range and multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease and renal events. In both trials, participants were randomized to identical uh, blood pressure intervention and intensive systolic blood pressure goal less than 120 or to a standard systolic blood pressure goal of less than 140. Now, the blood pressure um, measurements in both studies was standardized with three readings, the mean of the three after five minutes uh, uh, rest in the uh, clinical size, the blood pressure intervention in both a core BP and a spring were essentially similar in the intensive group. If the goal systolic blood pressure was not reached, medication were adjusted on a monthly basis until achieving a systolic blood pressure less than 120. In the standard group, the medication were adjusted to achieve systolic blood pressures between 135 and 139, and the medication dose was reduced if systolic blood pressure was less than 130 on a single visit, or between 130 and 134 on two consecutive visits. In both groups, medication were intensified if systolic blood pressure was 160 or greater on a single visit, or 140 or greater on two consecutive visits. Likewise, medication were intensified if diastolic blood pressure was 100 on a single visit or 90 uh, on, or more higher in two consecutive visits. What you see here in this um, graph is the systolic blood pressure means with 90% confidence interval during follow-up in a core BP on the left and a spring. You can appreciate that very quick during the study a significant separation between the arms occurring in both studies, and that separation was sustained during the entire uh, length of the studies. The mean systolic blood pressure in the standard arm in a core BP was 131 in a spring, 135. The mean uh, systolic blood pressure in the intensive arm in a core BP was 118, in the spring was 119. Now, in this table, what you see here is the utilization of antihypertensive classes at the most recent visit before censoring. Uh, a higher number of uh, medication were used in the intensive uh, uh, goal groups in both studies with a median of three antihypertensive compared to two in the standard uh, groups. In the intensive uh, groups, a higher um, uh, frequency of first line antihypertensive the most effective antihypertensives were used compared to the standard groups, including RAS blockers, 
diuretics, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. There was a higher also uh, frequency of use of uh, beta blockers in all the uh, um, uh, groups. And that's because of a high enrollment of patients with uh, ischemic heart disease. Now, the cardiovascular disease outcome definitions, the primary CVD outcome in a COVID-P was the composite of MI, non-fatal stroke or CVD mortality. The primary CVD uh, outcome in spring was the composite of MI, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, or CVD mortality. In both studies, secondary outcome, including the individual events, all-cause mortality, and the composite of CVD events and all-cause mortality. In a core BP, we additionally included an exploratory post-arc modified composite CVD outcome of first occurrence MI, um, non-fatal stroke, heart failure, unstable angina, or CVD mortality. The renal event outcomes of the study in both a core BP and spring, the primary renal outcomes were incidence of albuminuria and end-state renal disease in a core BP. The secondary renal outcome was the composite of first occurrence of a rise of serum creatinine of more than 3.3 in the uh, absence of AKI or end-state renal disease. In the spring, secondary renal outcomes were at least 50% reduction in EGFR and the composite of 50% reduction in EGFR or end-state renal disease in the subgroup with CKD at baseline, defined as EGFR less than 60, and at least 30% reduction in EGFR to less than 60 in the subgroup without CKD at baseline. The standard statistical analysis were done. Baseline characteristics were analyzed by chi-square t-test or will consume run, uh, run tests as appropriate. The main uh, assessment of outcomes was made by using survival statistics to estimate the effect of targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal compared to a standard, using as a reference the standard systolic blood pressure goal. You will see cumulative hazard curves uh, constructed with Kaplan-Meier uh, method compared with low run tests and adjusted for this model for CVD and all mortality included age, gender, ancestry, prevalence of CVD at baseline, smoking, statin use, aspirin use, diastolic blood pressure at baseline, and fasting blood sugar. Adjusted cut models for renal outcome including included age, gender, ancestry, baseline EGFR, and albuminuria. This table is a little busy and I'm going to walk you through the table this table compare the uh, 1,901 participants in a core BP that had a screening blood pressure between 130 uh, to 139 to 3,484 participants spring with that range of blood pressure. What you can appreciate in this slide is that spring participants were in general uh, six years older than a core BP spring had a higher uh, proportion of uh, males in the study. They have also a higher proportion of uh, patients of African ancestry. A core BP patient, uh, patient had a higher prevalence at baseline of cardiovascular disease. They have a higher uh, use of uh, statin at baseline. Similar use of aspirin were seen in both groups. A core BP patient had a higher um, EGFR baseline with higher albuminuria but lower prevalence of uh, chronic kidney disease defined as EGFR less than 60. Now these uh, table illustrate the baseline characteristics in a core BP and compared uh, the groups stratified by their treatment uh, by the goal uh, blood pressure goal a standard and intensive goal Overall, all baseline characteristics were well balanced between the two groups, the standard intensive uh, goal group. This uh, table similarly compare the baseline characteristics in spring between the standard goal and intensive goal. And again, overall, um, all characteristics were balanced between the two groups without, um, without much uh, difference. What you see here in this um, graph, is the cumulative hazard of the primary 
cardiovascular outcome in spring in a core BP. Now, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal in spring significantly reduced the hazard of the primary compulsive outcome compared to a standard. The adjusted uh, hazard ratio was 0.75 with 90% confident intervals that exclude what would make this uh, significant. The uh, 98 events occur in the intensive group with an incidence of 1.78%, 131 events in the standard group with an incidence of 2.37%. In a core BP, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal did not achieve a significant difference compared to the standard goal. Adjusted hazard pressure were uh, a favor. The use of intensive uh, uh, goal uh, control of 0.83, but the 90% confidence interval uh, cross one, which made them uh, non-significant. What you see here in this table is the subgroup analysis of the primary CVD outcome in spring. Overall, I want to guide you to the last column on the right. Uh, overall, the result, the primary results were homogeneous in all subgroups, with P for interaction that jointly had the subgroups uh, uh, joined with the strategy and the outcome uh, uh, non-significant. And you can see also in the forest plot in the middle that most of the uh, uh, subgroup benefit from intensive systolic blood pressure call overall. Now, what you see here is a subgroup analysis of the primary outcomes in a core BP. Overall, uh, most of the uh, subgroup have similar results and effects compared to the primary analysis, except for the uh, subgroups according to the glycemic goal intervention. A core uh, was a trial that uh, had a, what we call factorial design. They tested two additional intervention besides uh, blood pressure goal. One of them was a glycemic goal. They randomized participants to a standard glycemic goal, A1C goals between 7 and 7.9% or intensive glycemic goal, A1C goal of less than 6%. What you can see here in the adjusted p-value for interaction, there was a significant interaction, whereas there was a significant benefit of randomizing the patient to the intensive systolic blood pressure goal in the standard glycemic goal group, but in the intensive glycemic goal group, um, the, uh, the, uh, the therapy favored the standard uh, systolic blood pressure goal. There was an increased risk, but not significant. That uh, interaction or subgroup analysis better illustrated in this um, set of uh, graph. Uh, on the left, we have the core BP uh, subgroups of the standard glycemic goal, uh, uh, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal, uh, significantly reduced the risk of the primary outcome uh, with an adjusted hazard ratio of 0 0.61 and 90% uh, confidence intervals that exclude one uh, making that significant. However, in the ACORBP subgroup of intensive glycemic uh, goal, uh, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure initially had an increased hazard compared to the standard systolic blood pressure goal, particularly in the first year, and then flattened and became uh, parallel with the other group. Had just the hazard rate was 1.20, 20% increased risk. However, the 90% confidence interval include one and make that comparison non-significant. The following table illustrate the number of events, the rate uh, or incident per year, and adjust the hazard ratio in these four uh, subgroups uh, using uh, reference the standard glycemic, standard systolic blood pressure goal. Uh, in that uh, reference group, uh, had a higher number of events of 55 during the study with a higher incidence of 2.56% per year. Uh, the other three groups, they have a lower number of events that fluctuated or range from 36 to 41 and the incidence also was lowered uh, that range from 1.6% uh, to 1.91%. Adjust the hazard ratios uh, favor in those three groups 
uh, the use uh, of those interventions compared to the reference group. Now, this slide or table illustrate the secondary outcomes in spring. Overall, uh, a numerically lower number of events comparing the intensive groups, but only myocardial infarction uh, outcome was significantly uh, uh, different. Uh, targeting and systolic blood pressure goal uh, significantly reduced the risk of myocardial infarction with uh, just a hazard ratio of 0.65. Uh, this uh, table illustrates the secondary outcomes of a core BP. Overall, numerically, there were lower number of events in the intensive goal groups compared to the standard uh, group. However, only stroke was significant difference targeting a systolic blood pressure, uh, an intensive systolic blood pressure goal significantly reduced the risk of strokes uh, by 55%, adjust the hazard ratio of 0 0.45, 90% comes from the interval that is P1. Now, what you see here in this table is the renal outcomes, uh, the primary outcomes, uh, overall uh, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal in a core BP in a spring, significantly reduce the risk of uh, incident um, albuminuria. And stage renal disease events were numerically a little higher in the intensive group, but not significantly higher uh, in the intensive uh, uh, group compared to the standard group in Bob's study. This table uh, illustrates the secondary renal outcome in a core. Uh, uh, the secondary renal alcohol were, were, was not uh, significantly different between the intensive goal and the standard goal in a spring uh, subgroup of non-CKD patients at baseline. Patients who had an EGFR uh, 60 or higher at baseline, the secondary renal outcome of uh, at least 30% reduction in EGFR to less than 60 was significantly uh, higher uh, risk in the intensive uh, group compared to the standard goal group with an adjusted hazard ratio of 3.54. Uh, have to mention that none of the patients uh, in this uh, subgroup of spring patients without CKD at baseline reach end stage renal disease during uh, the follow up of the study. And most of those events were hemodynamic mediators without markers of a, a tubular injury. Now, this table illustrates the safety outcome. Overall, in a core BP in spring, serious adverse events were very similar in intensive goal and standard goal groups. Adverse events of a special interest, uh, hypotension, the incidence of hypotension was in general higher in the intensive goal uh, groups of both a core BP in spring compared to standard groups, serum potassium more than 5.5 incidents was uh, higher in the intensive goal group compared to the standard goal group in a core BP, uh, likely related to uh, the higher use and higher frequency use of RAS blockers in that particular subgroup. Now, the limitation of the study is that this is a pot hoc uh, analysis of a core BP in spring. Thus, the finding require confirmation in external cohorts there was a reduced statistical power in a core BP and subgroup analysis in both trials. Only 8.7% of participants were not using acting hypertensive as screening visit in, the, in both studies, limiting the uh, subgroup analysis of this particular subgroup of interest. The strength of the study is that it's a large number of participants uh, of patients with uh, stage one systolic hypertension with a total of uh, 5,385 both groups. The systolic blood pressure intervention in both studies were very effective and achieved sustained separation of both arms. A core and spring clinical site prospectively and systematically ascertained outcomes. CVD and renal outcome adjudication committees were blind to the randomized group and classify outcome using pre-specified case definition of outcomes. In summary, in a spring, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal significantly reduced the risk of the primary composite CBD outcome by 
with a number needed to treat of 50 and also reduce the risk of myocardial infarction by 35% with a number needed to treat of 90 during a median follow-up of 3.26 years. In a core BP, targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal significantly reduced the risk of stroke by 55% with the number needed to treat of 81 during a median follow of 4.99 years. In the standard glycemic goal subgroup, an intensive systolic blood pressure goal significantly reduced the risk of the primary composite CVD outcome by 39% with the number needed to treat of 28. Targeting an intensive systolic blood pressure goal significantly reduced the risk of incident microalbuminuria in both trials and increased the risk of the secondary outcome of at least 30% reduction in EGFR to less than 60 in the non-CKD subgroup of patients enrolled in SPRINT without significant effect on the risk of end stage renal disease in both trials. Conclusion, our study um, demonstrates that patients with stage one hypertension, systolic hypertension, and high CBD risk without or with diabetes have a CBD benefit associated to a tighter systolic blood pressure goal. Overall, the patient tolerated an intensive systolic blood pressure goal. Side effects were not significantly different or serious, and the intensive systolic blood pressure goal benefit or exceeded the potential of harm. Our results supported uh, treatment goals of the uh, 2017 guidelines uh, that recommend uh, uh, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure goal less than 130 in adults with high uh, CVD risk. The results also support the American Diabetes Association 2020 recommendation that for patients with type 2 uh, diabetes and hypertension at high cardiovascular risk for whom uh, less and stringent glycemic goal may be appropriate at, at a tighter or intensive blood pressure target uh, may be appropriate if it can be achieved uh, without any harm. There are approximately 12.1 million of USA adults with the stage one hypertension who also have a high risk of hypertension. 12.1 million, that's a large number of patients that can benefit from these interventions. I'd like to uh, you know, acknowledge and uh, uh, thanks um, uh, uh, to the um, uh, patients and uh, site participating in both studies and the steering committee to provide us the support to complete this study. And I'm going to open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. That was an excellent presentation. Very clear and uh, certainly gives us uh, uh, reason to think that maybe one th 135 over 82 is not really as good as it could be. Um, so thank you for that. We are out of time. It's, it's one o'clock. There was one question from, um, from the group. Uh, Dr. Montanez, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, uh, then we'll conclude with that. Uh, this is uh, Raul, Dr. Contreras. It uh, was a great presentation. I was uh, wondering if, uh, if the definition of ancestry in the studies were self-reported or by EMR uh, description. And my second question is if uh, even though you guys uh, like adjusted ancestry, you included ancestry in your prevalence adjusted model, did you guys uh, like, uh, like did a subgroup yeah, analysis yeah. In, in groups like, like for example, Hispanic, non-Hispanic uh, blacks, non-Hispanic whites. I mentioned this because uh, it's been shown previously that the, like, the CBD prevalence changes uh, according to groups, um, even though sometimes the prevalence of hypertension or diabetes is different also in these, in these groups. That's, that's, those are my two questions. Well, Thank you so first, um, you know, the um, ancestry was self-reported, but also was um, uh, ascertained by the clinics that enroll patients in both studies. And then second, yeah, well, all the adjusted analysis uh, that we did for the CVD outcomes and renal outcomes, including ancestry, uh, as the, the way that is, um, you know, um, uh, ascertained in the database of these two studies. Now, there are additional studies that came out from both that assess Hispanics 
compared to non-Hispanics and other ancestry compared to all styles. I can't really tell you the detail, but there are um, several publications on that topic for both uh, trials, like ORBP and, and SPRINT. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Thank you, everyone, for participating in Grand Rounds today. Please uh, be well and be safe, and we'll see you next week, if not before. Have a pleasant day. Thank you.